Lamp oil. Rope. Bombs. You want it? It's yours, my friend. As long as you have enough rubies. Welcome to the ultimate guide to subweapons in Splatoon 3. From grenades, to traps, to teleporters, we have it all. There's so many to choose from, but that makes learning all of them a huge task. We'll be covering the basics, as well as gear, utility, and even advanced techniques. Let's dive into what each sub is designed to do, and see if there's more to them than meets the eye. Let's start with the beginner subweapon, the very vanilla Splat Bomb. Don't be deceived though, this bomb is lethal, quick, and is a threat at all skill levels. It deals 180 damage at close range and 30 damage from its weaker distant hitbox. It uses 70% of your ink tank. If you want to throw two Splat Bombs in a single ink tank, it costs three mains and two subs of Sub Saver. Splattershot Jr. gets to cheat and has an extra large ink tank, so it can use double Splat Bombs easily with just two mains and one sub of Sub Saver. This bomb explodes quickly, so it can be used to throw in an area to force enemies to move away from it immediately or die. Similarly, you can also throw it on an area that you want to keep enemies out of, but it will only keep them away briefly. Splat Bomb has a timer that counts down only while it's on the ground, so if you roll it across the ground, it will explode quicker than if you threw it through the air. Rolling bombs are great to catch enemies who are jumping too much, as they can't move much while they're off the ground and can't react to it in time. You can also roll a bomb off an edge, and it won't explode until it hits the ground. This makes it extremely ambiguous and tricky for enemies to predict when it will go off. This bomb's great to drop by your feet while you're backing up from enemies, which you've probably seen a charger do once or twice. It stops people from pursuing the user, and there are few sub-weapons that can be used this well mid-engagement. Splat Bomb does great damage to objects like the Rainmaker and Splash Wall, and creates a lethal explosion when it hits it. Suction, Auto Bomb, Curling Bomb, and Fizzy also do this. I recommend using this to hit enemies who are too close to objects. It takes three Splat Bombs to destroy the Rainmaker shield, so you won't be able to do it instantly alone. You can also hit a crab from behind to one-hit the user. Because of its short explosion timer, Splat Bomb is also a great tool to put on a super jump marker to kill someone coming in. By throwing a bomb behind someone and another to cut off their escape, you can trap them and force them to fight you. This turns a flimsy painting weapon like the Splattershot Jr. into a surprisingly deadly aggro tool. Sub Power Up increases the travel speed, which means you can throw the bomb farther. A bit of Sub Power Up goes a long way with this weapon, since you'll be able to affect areas far away very quickly. Something to keep in mind though is that a well-timed squid roll will survive a Splat Bomb explosion even at close range, so this can be used to rush you down if you're not careful. Overall, Splat Bomb is so flexible and rounds out just about any kit it's put on. Weapons with short range may appreciate its ability to move enemies at a distance, but it's a threat at all ranges. Suction Bomb is the slower, more defensive cousin of Splat Bomb. It's not as quick to detonate, but it can stick to walls, ceilings, and even the tower. It's got a slightly larger radius than Splat Bomb, and deals 180 damage. It also uses 70% of your ink tank. It's great at all skill levels, but plays a more patient, supportive role on weapons. Because it takes longer to detonate, you can throw it ahead of you and then catch up to it while it explodes to get in easier. It can also displace enemies, but they have more time to react to it before it goes off. On the plus side, they're kept out of that space for longer until the bomb does eventually go off. It does the same amount of damage to objects as Splat Bomb, so I recommend using this on the Rainmaker Shield or enemy splash walls. It also takes three suction bombs to pop the Rainmaker Shield, and just like Splat Bomb, it costs you three mains and two subs of Sub Saver to throw two suctions. I don't really recommend it though. It's also great on tower control. You can throw a bomb on one side of the tower and then focus your fire on the opposite side to force enemies to leave. They'll have nowhere to hide. Suction bombs take longer time to have an effect, so be careful about being rushed down when you use one. You can't use it quite like a Splat Bomb and drop one just in front of you. I recommend trying to place suction bombs just on walls around corners, or on the walls below ledges. Also, almost any low roof is a good candidate. Enemies who peek out or drop will find a surprise. Because of the delay on the explosion, this bomb's surprisingly quiet, and easy to accidentally run into. You should place bombs where enemies might not be able to see them, or in places they're likely to want to push. If you use your subweapon like this, you'll be able to hold ground and stop enemies from dropping onto you. That's the main utility that this bomb has. Again, just like Splat Bomb, enemies can squid roll right through the suction bomb. 
So again, be careful about getting rushed down. Sub power up increases the travel speed and distance thrown, but because suction bomb takes longer to go off, it's not quite as useful as it is on splat bomb. Suction bomb leads weapons to play more patiently. It helps you play for setups, creating a disruption after a few seconds and giving you time to move up and prepare to take advantage of the space it creates. Nothing does aggression quite like the burst bomb. When this bomb hits an enemy or a surface, it instantly explodes for 60 damage on a direct hit or up to 35 from an indirect. It costs 40% of your ink tank to use. If you want to throw three of them, it will cost you three mains and two subs of sub saver. It's difficult to kill with burst bombs alone, as it takes three indirect hits to kill, but the enemy might have time to regenerate health between hits. Because of its blunt, large AoE effect, this subweapon is perfect for hitting nearby enemies who you can't exactly pinpoint. This also makes it perfect for sweeping clean areas or moving up into enemy territory and using it to force enemies to come out of their ink and engage with you. splash is notorious for playing aggressively and using this burst bomb to engage you in a fight. When the burst bomb hits someone, it makes a distinct damage noise. You can use this to determine whether there's an enemy in the area you threw the bomb, even if they're hiding. On the opposite end of the range spectrum, this bomb's also perfect for finishing a fight, or comboing with your main weapon for damage. Both Splatana Stamper and Carbon Deco utilize the Burst Bomb along with their weapon to turn a 70-ish damage hit into a lethal one. Burst Bomb can deal 25 damage to enemies farthest from the center of the hitbox, so be aware of this if you're trying to combo. Leading with Burst Bomb and then using your main weapon to finish them off is usually the best option. If you do it in the other order, you'll end up in a lot of lag. The ability to instantly damage enemies at a distance is extremely valuable, so Burst Bomb is a great companion at short range and long range. Sub Power Up increases the travel speed and distance thrown, just like Splat Bomb, so I'd recommend a little bit of it, especially with Splatana Stamper. Having the bomb's range at the same range as your main weapon makes the most sense if you want to combo damage, but extra range means you can pester enemies from very far away, even as a short range weapon. Just throwing a burst bomb instantly creates space and will likely force enemies like chargers off their perch. Burst bomb can also help you paint. It's perfect for painting walls, especially if your weapon doesn't excel at it. Another great use is to throw one right at your feet when you're in enemy territory. It helps you keep up your momentum and not get stuck. You can also use it to help cap the zone, but you should consider whether it's a better use of ink to just paint with your main weapon. Don't use burst bomb on the rainmaker or other objects. Its damage is pretty pathetic, and its explosions aren't lethal. Splash Wall is a pretty good check to Burst Bomb because of this downside. Another thing you have to worry about when using Burst Bomb is your ink tank. It's really easy to want to spam this sub weapon. Ultimately though, the sub isn't designed to work just on its own, and instead more as a disruption and combo tool. Use it while playing aggressively alongside your main weapon to get the most out of it. Burst Bomb doesn't create space for very long, but it can slow players' momentum. When defending, you should use Burst Bomb specifically to stop players from rushing you. Throwing one just a bit in front of you as you back up can reveal and stifle enemies who got too aggressive. Overall, Burst Bomb's insanely efficient. It's perhaps the best chip damage sub, can also be thrown to create space, and gives immediate information on hidden players. Almost any kid in the game would welcome a Burst Bomb. Curling Bomb slides across the floor, bonking into enemies or bouncing off walls as it goes, and eventually blows up. It leaves a nice ink trail behind it that you can swim in. If you hold the R button and then release it, you throw the Curling Bomb shorter and it explodes quicker with a larger radius. If Curling Bomb bumps you, it deals 20 damage, but the explosion deals 180 damage just like the other lethals. Like Splat and Suction, it costs 70% of your ink tank, so it takes 3 mains and 2 subs of Sub Saver to throw 2 of them, and 3 bombs to destroy the Rainmaker. This bomb's a bit weird. Splatoon's a very vertical game, with plenty of walls and high grounds that you can climb up to. Curling Bomb can't be thrown upwards and only slid across the ground, though you can jump and throw the bomb just on a ledge. This greatly limits its utility. But unlike the other bombs we've covered so far, this leaves a trail of ink behind it as it moves. This is extremely useful as a mobility tool. If you're a roller or sploosh you can use this to paint your way into enemy territory easily and swim behind it. However, this can be a bit predictable, so be sure you're aware of who's watching you, and maybe don't swim right on top of the curling bomb. Although curling bomb doesn't go to high ground, roller can use curling to get underneath ledges and attack the high ground using its main weapon. Another of the best uses of curling bomb is dropping it over a ledge. 
Much like Splat Bomb, you can quote unquote roll it off a ledge and have it detonate right after it falls. By holding R and controlling how far the bomb goes, you can use curling to check over ledges and kill hidden enemies. Sub power up increases the travel speed and thus the distance the curling bomb travels. It's up to preference whether you want it, but the extra distance tends not to mean much, as it only nets you a bit more paint. Overall, Curling Bomb is a niche sub that helps short range or otherwise low mobility weapons push into enemy territory. It can be extremely useful on these weapons and allow them to play independently of their team and painters, but comes at the cost of being able to affect high ground. Auto Bomb, Chicken, whatever you want to call it, this sub weapon has had a bit of a glow up since Splatoon 2 despite not receiving any apparent buffs. Autobomb is similar to the Splat Bomb, but it trades off some speed of explosion for information. Autobomb locks onto anyone near where it lands, even if they're hidden in their own ink. Because of that, it's great to throw into enemy territory and use the direction the bomb starts walking in to figure out where enemies are. It's a great partner for the blaster, which only needs to know the general area enemies are in to hit them. Blaster also happens to be one of my main weapons. Autobomb deals 180 damage just like the other lethal bombs, but only costs 55% of your ink tank. This lets you continue playing with your main weapon much easier than more expensive bombs would. Autobomb has a smaller hitbox than Splat Bomb and takes significantly longer to go off, so you have to play somewhat independently from your bomb. I love throwing Autobomb behind someone, getting into a fight with them, and then letting the bomb walk up behind them and explode while they're fighting me. Autobomb's not the biggest threat in the world, but it's a persistent one that enemies will have to move from and keep in mind. Enemies can walk close to the autobomb to bait the explosion and get it to stop following them. People usually only get hit by an autobomb if they don't know it's there, so if you're trying to get kills with this weapon, make sure they don't see the bomb. Here's a funny tech. If you throw an autobomb behind a crab and they don't go into ball form before it hits them, it will end up killing them actually. <laughs> Even though Autobomb costs much less ink, it does the same damage to the Rainmaker as Splat and Suction Bomb. Because of that, it's a great and efficient tool to use against the Rainmaker and other objects. It takes three Autobombs to destroy the Rainmaker shield, and only costs one main of Sub Saver if you want to throw two bombs in a single ink tank. If you have Object Shredder, two Autobombs destroy a splash wall. This could be really useful in matchups like the 52 Gal, who tend to rush you down. Autobomb's not great for super jump landings. If anybody else is nearby, the bomb will just walk after them and leave wherever the super jump is. I wouldn't recommend trying to do this. Sub power up increases the travel speed and distance thrown, just like all the other bombs we've covered. This helps you pester chargers or other players sitting in the back line, forcing them to stay on their toes and keep moving. Overall, Autobomb is a flexible, strong all-rounder. It gives info about hiding enemies and can create openings for you to engage. It's not the most useful in the middle of a fight, as it takes a long time to explode, but it's a valuable sub that helps bait and punish weapons succeed. Ink Mine is a defensive trap that both damages and marks players who walk or swim near it. It doesn't affect anything at a distance, but it's often a perfect pairing to weapons like Elator or Rapid Blaster, who don't have trouble with being outranged and can survive just fine on their own. You can place up to two ink mines at once, and they are invisible to the enemy if they're in your ink. If you place a third mine, the ink mine you placed earliest will blow up. You can sometimes use this to set traps. Ink mine's explosion does 45 damage up close, down to 30 damage farther away, and marks the enemies who get hit for 5 seconds. Its marking hitbox is bigger and lasts longer than the damage, so even if an enemy doesn't get hit with the damage, they can still get marked. Enemies who paint and swim very quickly through the ink mine's area might not get hit, but they usually are marked. Ink mine uses 60% of your ink tank, but there isn't much reason to try and place two at once. You can't place ink mines within an existing ink mine's radius. Ink mine leaves you without a sub weapon most of the time, but it's a great tool for trying to lock down the map and watch areas that enemies might try and sneak through. Its damage combos with the rapid blaster direct hit for a kill, making approaching this weapon risky. Ink mines are best to place in choke points, narrow areas that the enemy has to push through or areas that enemies frequently drop into. It's also great to drop on a flank, like the sides on Hagglefish Market. When the ink mine goes off, you'll know someone's flanking even if you're nowhere near there. Putting two mines in a choke point helps guarantee they hit their target and aren't dodged. Your sub weapon doesn't help you push very much. I recommend moving extra far forward to drop down a mine and then immediately backing up to get the most value out of your sub weapon. 
you can punish enemies who try and rush you afterwards. As a result, it's definitely more of a bait and punish tool. Inkmine is very useful to hold the zone on splat zones. By dropping multiple mines in the zone, enemies who paint over it or move onto the zone itself will get caught in the blast and the paint will help recap the zone. Likewise, painting over an ink mine is the best way to get it to go off without hitting you. If you paint enough on top of it, it explodes. If you're playing against an ink mine, I recommend painting the splat zone to check for mines before you actually push into it. If you're precise, you can actually place two ink mines on the tower if you place one at each corner. It helps you defend it crazy well, but I feel like this is a little bit more difficult to pull off than it's worth. Oh yeah, I highly recommend sub power up on ink mine. It increases the radius, which, as you remember from geometry class, increases the area by the square of that radius. In other words, it's really good. It doesn't quite have the diminishing returns other subs do. I like about a main of sub power up, but any amount is great. Ink mine's a niche but potentially very powerful sub weapon that works best with weapons that have range and like defending. It's not great for everything, but it provides interesting utility. Also, uh, it looks really funny in lockers. Toxic Mist is the first of these sub weapons that doesn't deal damage. It fulfills a similar role as the ink mine, but comes in the form of a throwable mist that drastically slows and drains ink from anyone who stays in it. In a lot of ways, this can act like a worst version of Burst Bomb. It quote unquote damages players in a radius and makes it easier to follow up damage on them. This would work best with weapons like Rapid Pro or Zinc Mini, aka Zimmy, which have the range and spray slash AoE to follow up on players that get stuck. Strong weapons that are ink hungry or throw lots of bombs like Sloshing Machine frequently run out of ink while in a toxic mist, and will slowly take damage from your ink as they can't paint over it. These are also the best targets for your sub weapon if used aggressively. But I think the main strong point of Toxic Mist is its ability to keep people out. Unlike Ink Mine, which is very secretive about where the trap is set, Toxic Mist marks off an area and says, good luck trying to push me. Enemies can still push through Mist, but they risk you or a teammate attacking whoever tries and gets slowed. Enemies who swim into Toxic Mist are visible even with Ninja Squid by a slight glow, and it also makes a noise. This means even if you're not looking, you can tell when an enemy walks into your mist. Most importantly, Toxic Mist lingers, and you can have more than one out at once. This means you can constantly be changing which areas you want to control, smoothly transition from one to the next without any downtime. It costs two main and one sub of Sub Saver to throw two mists, though I'd highly recommend just staggering them, one after the other, and giving yourself time to regenerate ink. When enemies play against a Toxic Mist team, the mist is more of an inevitability, and not something you can just wait out. They need to fight despite the mist being out. This leads me to another of the best parts of Toxic Mist, Choke Points. Like Ink Mine, this is able to watch your flanks. However, actively slowing enemies who might be flanking or just straight up rushing you is a valuable tool for a lot of weapons. The extra moment when you realize someone is pushing you can help weapons like Zimmy, which need a moment to charge to be ready. Examples include the mid on Hagglefish Market, which enemies, often with Ninja Squid, will try to rush through if you give them a moment. Keeping a Toxic Mist in that area as often as you can is important, but you should prioritize the Mist uptime when you're the closest and in the riskiest positions. Keeping a Toxic Mist in an area as often as you can is important, but you should prioritize the Mist uptime when you're the closest and in the riskiest positions. Generally, keeping Mist in front of you at about the same range as your main weapon works best. Overall, Toxic Mist is a flexible area denial tool, which happens to work really well into the current Ninja Squid meta. I expect to see more Tri-Slosher and Zinc Mini in comps that are weak to the meta. Point Sensor is another support subweapon that doesn't do any damage. Instead, it creates a brief area of effect where any user's hit are marked for a base of 8 seconds. This shows you exactly where enemies are, so it gives you the upper hand in a fight and can let you pre-fire as the enemies push around corners. It costs 45% of your ink tank. Point Sensor doesn't require line of sight to work. You can throw it at the stacks on Inkblot, and it will show you enemies on the opposite side of it. This is extremely useful, and rewards you for knowing the general area that your opponents are in. The marking effect can be seen by your whole team, so it can help your teammates play smarter as well. It works great into Ninja Squid, and discourages enemies from rushing you. However, it doesn't actually stop them, so be prepared for a rush. Generally, you want to throw sensors towards enemies, but particularly towards areas you're unsure about and want to know more. 
Often, these are choke points, but any blind corner is also worthwhile. Be sure to get your point sensors in before you actually engage with enemies. Sub Power Up improves both the distance you throw sensor as well as the duration enemies are marked for. On the receiving end, Sub Defense reduces the time you're marked if hit by an enemy point sensor. One sub of Sub Resistance reduces the time from 8 seconds marked down to about 6.5, so if sensor is frustrating you, just a little bit of Sub Resistance is a great investment. Point Sensor doesn't have advanced utility, but it's a useful sub that gives you lots of information to help with your and your teammates' fights. It shows you exactly where enemies are and makes them play the game at a slower pace. It probably falls off if you have more than one in a team composition, but it's helpful nonetheless. Splashwall puts down a shower of ink that can be used to block enemy fire. It costs 60% of your ink tank and has 800 HP. This HP depletes over time or when it's shot. If you try to throw a splash wall while one's already out, the first wall will disappear. It's affected by Object Shredder. The little tank in the middle of the wall shows you how much HP is left. Sub Power Up increases this uh, HP amount, but I'm not really a big fan of it. Splash Wall is unique among sub weapons for its crazy powerful ability in 1v1 fights. If you toss one down and stay behind it, you can shoot at enemies and watch as they have no options to hit you. Of course, that's if they stay in front of you. Enemies can of course back up when you toss a wall down, but that just gives you the space that you wanted. To get the most out of this, you want to push up as far as is safe, push down a wall, and also try to hold your ground while that wall lasts. Your main goal as a splash wall user is to take area and hold it down as best you can. To make the most of this, you want to target areas that are in between the enemy spawn and the objective. You want to be a major nuisance to stop the enemy team from getting into important areas on the map. Unfortunately, splash wall is a double-edged sword. If an enemy throws a lethal bomb at the splash wall, it explodes and will kill you if you're on the same side of the wall as the bomb. Because of that, if you place a wall down and try to move in front of it, the other team could just throw a bomb into your wall and kill you. This means that once you push down a wall, it might be hard to push in front of it. What you can do though is throw another wall slightly farther forward and then move up once your first wall disappears. Splash wall is an obnoxious tool for aggressive weapons like 52 gal. Once you give them an inch, they take a mile and become extremely difficult to challenge. This creates a danger zone, where the wall user can control the paint, and if it's splat zones, the objective. The best way to deal with a splash wall user is to circle around the wall and try to bombard the wall with bombs. Trying to push the splash wall is a sure way to get yourself killed, so either wait for backup or try to use the splash wall against the user. Blasters and sloshers can hit around or above the wall, so be mindful of these both with and against it. Splash Wall deals 30 damage if an enemy bumps into it. It's not extremely useful, but if you place a Splash Wall on a super jump landing, you can deal some damage to the jumper. It also means enemies can't get too close to the Splash Wall or else they'll get hit. Raymaker just eats Splash Wall. Throwing a Splash Wall into an enemy wall also just eats your wall. It's not meant to deal damage, you know? Be mindful of these when you throw one out. There's also an interesting tech with Splash Wall where you can throw one onto a ledge above you. Normally, the distance splash wall gets thrown is set, and you can't really affect the angle. However, by aiming down, the wall somehow manages to end up there. This can be useful for camping ledges. Splash wall is an interesting tool that can help an enemy push extremely aggressively, but also act as a double-edged sword with counterplay. Be mindful of bombs, and you'll gain the upper hand in your 1v1 fights. Cross up enemies by going to the opposite side of the wall as they are, and you'll be able to come out on top. Sprinkler is probably the most boring of the sub-weapons, but it still has its utility. When you throw it out, it begins painting a small area around it, and it slows down its speed quickly over time. These sprinklers can stick to walls and even ceilings, but can be destroyed easily by gunfire. Mostly, the sprinkler should be used to paint up in areas you're not focusing, as well as to help you charge your special. Throw it in an area you're not going towards, and then go back to your normal gameplay. It accomplishes this just fine, but it leaves you without a bomb in your fights. It costs 60% of your ink tank to use. One of the most fun things to do with Sprinkler is find weird places to put them. If you're looking for places that are high up and hidden from enemy fire, there's a lot of weird geometry in this game. You can put it on the banners in Museum, the ceiling on Mako Mart, and many more locations. Keeping a Sprinkler active near the middle of the map is quite useful and can keep the paint up while the rest of your team is trying to fight. But on the other hand, did you know that Sprinklers can deal damage? It's sort of niche, but if an enemy steps on your sprinkler and doesn't shoot it immediately, 
They can get uh, put in the blender and die. It deals 20 damage per hit, but unless you're right on top of it, don't count on those hits actually doing anything. This can end up being pretty funny if you drop it on a super jump marker. If they shoot it though, they'll break the sprinkler before they die to it. You can use the same sort of thing in the middle of fights. By throwing sprinkler near the enemy's feet, you can make them run out of paint or accidentally walk into it and take damage. This works best against low mobility weapons like blasters. The sprinkler can actually be used to pop the Rainmaker. If you throw it into the Rainmaker, nothing happens, it's gone. But if you kill someone carrying the Rainmaker and then drop a sprinkler on that spot before the Rainmaker respawns, it will damage the Rainmaker for you. It will get stuck inside and repeatedly deal damage until it eventually pops. It does fair damage to it, though sadly it used to be a little bit better in Splatoon 2. You can only have one sprinkler out at once. If you try and throw a second one, the first one will disappear. Additionally, if you die while your sprinkler's out, it also disappears. Sprinkler can be used to help with mobility quite a bit. When sprinkler lands, it puts down a bit of ink instantly. This can be very useful when you get stuck at enemy turf. Just look down and throw a sprinkler at your feet and you'll have a patch ready. It's most useful on weapons like 96 gal that might have a hard time painting their feet. In addition to the ground, you can also paint walls with sprinkler. If you throw it at the middle of a wall you want to climb, it's often enough to get up without using your main weapon at all. This is helpful for weapons like Brella or 96 gal which might take multiple shots to paint a wall. Sub power up increases how long the sprinkler's fast painting mode lasts. It's not particularly useful. Overall, Sprinkler is a bit underwhelming, but it fills the role of a painting support subweapon, and it can help out in spots like super jump landings or rainmaker pops where other support subweapons like Toxic Mist or Ink Mine would be useless. If you love your special weapon, this sub certainly helps you get it faster. Squid Beacon is a powerful, unique tool that can let you super jump to them at any time. It costs a whopping 75% of your ink tank. You can place up to three beacons, each of which has two uses. If you, as the person who placed the beacon, jump to it, the beacon's instantly destroyed. If one of your teammates jumps to it, it will only take one of the uses. This beacon is also easily destroyed by enemy fire. These beacons are visible on the map to both teams, meaning that if your opponent has a beacon user, you should be checking the map to see where their beacons are placed and destroy them. If a beacon's destroyed while someone's jumping to it, the normal super jump marker appears. Beacons are an incredible tool for keeping your team alive and present on the map. They allow teammates to jump back into the action even if there isn't a teammate to jump to, and can even be used to put teammates in aggressive positions on flanks. Be sure to check the map when you're respawning if you have a beacon user as a teammate. They put them there for a reason. Unfortunately, beacon doesn't actively push your team forward. It's incredible for holding ground, but it can enable you or other teammates to push easier. Beacon actually has one secret ability. It's not explicitly stated in the game, but if you place a beacon and then pull up your map, you'll be able to see all enemies near them. This works for your whole team, not just you, so they can see it too. This means it's advantageous to try and place beacons near busy areas on the map, near mid, or in enemy territory. It also makes you want to prioritize keeping your beacons alive and making them hard to find. It's hard to use this mid-combat, so I recommend using the revealed enemies to help inform where you push rather than use specifically to target a player. For example, if you see three enemies grouped up on left, you might want to push right. Hiding your beacons is an important skill for any beacon user. If you leave them out in the open, they'll get broken instantly, or worse yet, will just be destroyed accidentally by random shots. The best places to put beacon are usually in corners, just under drops, and in areas that players typically get through and then don't come back to. Usually walls that face away from the enemy spawn are best for aggressive beacons. Places like the drop on Undertow Spillway, behind the walls on Hagglefish, and hidden on that stack on Inkblot are great spots for beacons. Sub Power Up improves the speed of any super jumps to your beacons. Just a few subs is extremely noticeable, and this benefits the whole team. One sub of quick super jump is also useful for your own purposes. Overall, Beacon's an interesting utility sub that can help keep your team's pressure up and not give the enemy a chance to breathe. It also gives some info and rewards you for placing them aggressively. It fits best with more aggressive team compositions, which the Dapple Dually can support very well. Here we go. Fizzy Bomb is the first of two sub-weapons added midway into Splatoon 2's life. It's a soda can that you can shake to power up, and then can explode multiple times based on how powered up it is. 
To use it, hold down the sub-weapon button, R. By flicking your left stick left and right, shaking your controller, or jumping, you can charge up your fizzy bomb up to twice. You'll hear a little noise once it powers up a level. Once you let go of R, you'll throw the bomb. The bomb can explode up to three times if you charge it. You can also just press R to throw the bomb, and it will explode once. It costs the same amount of ink no matter how much you charge it. Fizzy Bomb only costs 60% of your ink tag, somehow even less than Splat and Suction Bombs. If you wear two mains and one sub of Sub Saver, you can throw two Fizzy Bombs in one ink tank. A direct hit with Fizzy Bomb deals 50 damage, while a weak hit deals 35. This means if you get hit with three weak explosions of a charged Fizzy Bomb, you'll die. You can survive this though. If you wear two subs of Sub Defense, you'll survive the Fizzy. Alright, that's the basics of the weapon. Now, what can it really do? Everything. Fizzy is probably the most absurd sub weapon in the game, due to its utility. First off, when you throw a Fizzy Bomb, it paints a trail behind it on the ground. You can use this like a curling bomb to paint a path and follow it. Second, you can use it like a burst bomb. By throwing an uncharged Fizzy Bomb, anyone near it gets hit quickly for 35 damage. This can combo with the Sloshing Machine's direct hit for a kill. That's just with an uncharged Fizzy Bomb. If you charge it, it suddenly becomes a disruption and stalling tool like the other lethal bombs. Charge a Fizzy and then roll it across the ground like a Splat Bomb to slow its momentum. This makes the Fizzy explosions happen closer together making it easier for enemies to get caught in multiple hits. On the other side, you can throw it at an upwards angle if you want this same effect to hit high ground. The farther upwards you throw it, the slower its horizontal momentum. You can use this to throw a fizzy at a charger's perch and annoy them. Fizzy explosions also paint fairly well. You can throw a charged one at the zone to paint, which is especially useful for weapons like Luna Blaster Neo, which can't do it very well with its main weapon. However, something to be mindful of is that fizzy bombs generally keep going in the same direction you threw them when they explode. So, if you throw a charged fizzy at an enemy's feet, the second and third explosions will end up behind them. If they back up, they'll get hit by them all, but if they just move forwards towards you, they can dodge all of the blasts. That's one way to play around fizzy bomb, move towards the user slightly and ignore the bomb. For weapons like Sloshing Machine though, that can work in the user's favor as it's very powerful at punishing bad approaches. Since the fizzy bomb moves forward as it goes off, I recommend throwing it at areas where the enemies can't dodge it by moving to the sides. So, they have to either back up or drop into you. Areas like this can include the stacks on Makomart or top left on Tower Inkblot. Generally, long flat areas where the enemy doesn't want to back up. Additionally, you can push forward with your fizzy bomb as it takes some time for the second and third explosions to go off. Fizzy Bomb does insane damage to objects. Two fully charged Fizzy Bombs destroys the Rainmaker, which you can do alone. If you have Object Shredder on, just one fully charged Fizzy destroys a Splash Wall. With all these upsides, what's the catch? Why can this sub weapon do so much? First off, you'll find Fizzy on a lot of strange or otherwise awkward kits. Ballpoint Splatling would probably prefer a special besides Inkjet, but because it has Fizzy Bomb, the kit is suddenly much more appealing. Aerospray with Reef Slider seems a bit awkward, and not the best special for a heavy painting weapon, but Fizzy Bomb enables it to reach far away and high up places like it never could before. The next issue with Fizzy Bomb is the white ink time. White ink, named after the color your bar turns, is the time after you use a sub weapon before you can start regenerating ink. After you throw a Fizzy Bomb, you can't regen ink for a very long time. This was how Fizzy was nerfed in the most recent patch. Because of this white ink, it often feels like Fizzy costs more ink than it does. It's very easy to run out if you use your main weapon right after a Fizzy Bomb, so be mindful of this when you fight. Lastly, there's the whole charging mechanic. You really can only use charged Fizzy Bombs before you engage in a fight, as it takes time to charge them. You can easily get punished for charging without thinking, and then get rushed down by enemies before you throw it. Fizzy just has so much utility. It's an absolutely bonkers sub whose downsides are mainly the weapons it's on and its ink management. It can do just about anything you want, but leave you susceptible to getting rushed down if you're not careful. Much like Splat Bombs, Fizzy Bombs are a whole field of study you could write a thesis on. Torpedo is one of the only sub weapons that forces your opponent to interact with it. When you throw it through the air, it locks onto an enemy and heads towards them, even if they're hiding. The enemy can shoot the torpedo, and any hit will destroy it, but if you don't shoot it down, they're in a world of trouble. 
torpedo does 60 damage if it hits you, and then drops a barrage of 12 damage hitboxes. It nearly kills you, paints your feet, and if you're unlucky, you can get hit by multiple of the damaging droplets. It costs 65% of your ink tank, but you can only have one torpedo out on the field at once. The subweapon is extremely flexible and obnoxious to deal with. First off, you can use it to find hiding enemies by following the direction it heads, just like Autobomb. It's great for keeping up your momentum and not having to slow down to search and paint out players who are sharking. Perhaps the most annoying thing Torpedo does is force the target to choose between you or the torpedo. If the opponent has to aim and shoot the torpedo, you can rush them down. But if they target you, the torpedo hits them. This 50-50 is powerful, but mostly applicable against weapons that don't shoot quickly, like blasters. If you throw a torpedo straight at a blaster's face, not only will the torpedo block their shot, but they'll be in lag from that shot for quite a while. The same thing works with sloshers, and it can also force chargers to give up their full charge to deal with the torpedo. It's definitely the weakest against shooter weapons like splash matic and Splattershot. They only need a split second and a single bullet to take out the torpedo, so it's less useful to throw it straight at them. Instead, I'd recommend throwing torpedoes over a player's head so that it locks onto them from behind. That way, your opponents need to do a full 180 to hit the torpedo, and you can approach while they look away. If the torpedo hits them, you only need to deal a little bit of damage to get a trait. Something particularly interesting about torpedo is that it only locks on if it hasn't touched the ground or a wall yet. If it hits one of those, it just detonates like a splat bomb after a period of time. So if you just want to use the damaging hitbox and don't want enemies to be able to shoot it down, you can either roll your torpedo across the ground or bounce it off terrain. If you do these, you can use it much like a burst bomb to deal quick damage to enemies. This works great if you're Splatana Wiper and can combo a rolled torpedo with a vertical slash or two horizontals to kill. You can also bounce your torpedoes off walls if you want to get this damage on enemies who are far away. The lock-on hitbox is rather large, so it can be difficult to get it to hit enemies without locking on. Torpedo does okay damage to the Rainmaker, but it's probably not better than your main weapon. Torpedo is a flexible subweapon that works particularly well against blasters or weapons that like to shark. You can smoke out enemies, distract and rush them down, or just tip at them from a distance. It's a great companion to just about any weapon, but works particularly well on aggressive weapons that are looking to force the enemy to engage with them. And lastly, we have the Angle Shooter. It's the first new subweapon introduced in Splatoon 3. It's also called the Line Marker, or if you want, the Markiplier. Um, it costs 40% of your ink tank, and if you use three mains and two subs of Sub Saver, you can throw three markers in a single ink tank. It has absurd range, more than e -Later, and bounces off walls. It deals 30 damage if you hit someone directly. If enemies are hit or they walk into the lingering line, they get marked for 6 seconds. This sub doesn't do too much damage, so it can't get kills on its own. It's a bit strange to try and figure out how to use this sub weapon. It can hit from farther than you can follow up on with your main weapon. It's not amazing at close range, and it marks players, but much less than point sensor. One thing I do know about it though is it's extremely annoying. One angle shooter isn't too bad, but because you can throw too easily in an ink tank, you can randomly ping people from across the map and help with fights you're not a part of. Doing this against e -Later specifically is very funny, and helps Jet Squelcher and Slosher Deco with the matchup. You can also utilize the marking potential by not throwing the marker directly at someone, but instead blocking off a choke point with it. By bouncing it off a wall, you can make it cover the whole horizontal range. You're unlikely to hit someone when you ricochet the angle shooter, but it still applies pressure. I recommend throwing most of your angle shooters mostly parallel to the ground, so it stays the same height off the ground throughout. If you do that, it's harder for enemies to avoid the line. I think mid-range is the best distance to use the line marker at. If you see someone in easy line of sight, throw it at them. If you don't have any good targets, try using it to span choke points or act like a tripwire in common areas, discouraging enemies from pushing through them. Angle Shooter has a combo kill on Slosher Deco. A direct from the marker and then a slosh from the main weapon combines to 100 damage exactly, giving the weapon a surprisingly quick kill. It does exactly 100, so this combo would not work if the enemies wore any sub-defense or regenerate any health in between the hits. Don't use the marker on the Rainmaker Shield, it doesn't do very much damage. Sub Power Up increases how long the mark lasts, which might be worth a sub or two as that's the main utility the Angle Shooter has. Overall, Angle Shooter is an underpowered sub-weapon that hasn't quite found its home yet. 
it can pester backlines and cover some ground at mid-range, as well as give info to enemies who haphazardly run into it. So it's got some things going for it. Right now, it's going to be used for things like the combo on Slosher Deco or the special that its kit comes with. I do hope we see this sub buffed in the future. And that about covers it. Sub weapons can open up a lot of options for weapons and add another layer of complexity to the game. Some of them are stronger than others, but there are so many trade-offs that pretty much any sub weapon can succeed in the right environment. Nintendo balances weapons and their kits together, and they all fulfill different roles, so there's no objectively best one. Every weapon recontextualizes what its sub means, so get out there and experiment. Maybe you'll find a combo that does exactly what you want. Thanks so much for sticking through to the end. I put a lot of work into this video, so leave a comment or subscribe if you enjoyed it.